Okay, cool. I'm just gonna be a little fly here. Okay. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. <laughs> Um, so we're going to do this talk a little bit like a conversation between the three of us and uh, because it makes it a little bit more easy to be spontaneous we won't use a mic but if we are talking too fast or not loud enough then just put your hand up and let us know. Um, and yeah for this talk we have this kind of idea that we are on a big map and we will travel between different topics. Uh, so maybe we start at the beginning. <laughs> Let's start at the beginning. Uh, how long do we have? I, I mean, like, two hours is probably too oh. long. We definitely won't go for two hours. <laughs> but we have Six some, hours. Like, yeah. hours will be fine. And okay. yeah, I don't know if you want to introduce also yourselves, which I didn't Of course, do we well. will. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, well. Here we are at the very start. <laughs> uh, I guess we should uh, introduce. Yeah, you. I'm Chloe and. I'm Gabriel. Hello. Hello, and I'm Jira. And <laughs> we are. Fantasia <laughs> Malware. We should say it to, normally, we should say it together, right? But it just didn't work out. Um, so, maybe to give a bit of background about how we started working together. Um, a long time ago, we used to be in a very big collective together called Triple A, with 10 members. Um, and we were very young and idealistic. And then we had a big fight with all of the other people in the collective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this collective broke up. And out of this, um, we formed a new collective with the three of us. Um, and. I think something that was really nice about beginning to work together was we'd already worked together a long time, so we very quickly found a way to work together that was very like tight um, and organic. But maybe I should also, I don't know how much background people have here, maybe I'll also give a quick intro to what kind of work we make. Yeah. yeah. Um, we make video games, but also performances, um, and we also run an event series called Fantasia Malware Presents. And yeah, I guess we will explain a little bit more about all these aspects during the talk. Great. <laughs> um, OK, so that was a brief history. Do we want to get into AAA or like where Fantasia Malware came from at all? Or what do you think? Is there anything to say? I f maybe we could just say that it, yeah, what you basically said, that it was like a bigger collective. It was uh, t 10 people. 10 people, right? which made it interesting, but also very, uh, how do you call it, patchworky with very different. Bureaucratic. Bureaucratic also, and especially if you want to have like this non hierarchical group, uh, which is a good idea, but it's also always pretty difficult to Im implement. And uh, I guess the, the thing that we carried over from this collective is the way that we want to work together, which is, um, I guess in a normal game studio, there would be kind of the people yeah. who are writing the game, who are like the artists yeah. in a way. And then you have like smaller teams of people who are on these pipelines who do very specific jobs. Like so one person's job might be just the modeling or just the shaders. And we wanted to work together in a way where all of us are contributing to the creative ideas and all of us are doing different aspects of the creative work together. Yeah. Um, and also a little bit different mm -hmm. to the... Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <Thank> you. <laughs> also a little bit different to the model that lots of fine artists take, which is that there is like one artist who comes up with all the ideas and then there's some invisible people behind the scenes who make the art. Yeah. Um, so the thing that we carried over from this collective is wanting to work together in like a non-hierarchical way uh, where we sort of participate in all the aspects of the creative process together. And uh, I think it, it could still be possible to do this on a larger scale, but it is really like a lot much quicker and more organic with three people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, and uh, to explore this map further, we could talk about um, uh, like th th how we presented our games as AAA and how that changed the Fantasia Malware. Should we talk about this next, do you think? The games and performances? What do you think? 
Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. So, so like, I, I guess, like, um, another, like, it's also part of that history of like how we used to work together. Uh, so, being like kind of like arty, you know, weirdo, weirdo people and that make games, you like will um, have this uh, challenge where, which maybe some of you have also experienced, of basically. Uh, if you're kind of making like interactive work that has any kind of relationship to games, then you're often having to show it to people who don't have this literacy of of playing games or kind of experiencing games. And how do you actually like, uh, you know, like present your work in a way that is understandable to like non-game literate people? Um, so this is like something that we've been iterating over for a long time. Um, like with AAA, uh, we were basically trying to make the games uh, themselves more accessible. So like uh, over time, uh, we were like um, simplifying the way that they can be experienced, so that like uh, you know some uh, crusty old curator could like. Um, enjoy it too. Um, but, but also so that like uh, people who are friends who don't want to sit in front of a computer for like a hundred hours and play a game can enjoy them. Sure, yeah. And then, yes, and then there's also like uh, the other thing, the issue is the hardware as well it has to be, um, you know, the limitation of, you know, games are often, like the commercial games often re require like gaming hardware, which then requires like, you know, people to invest in this, which means also that if you're making games for non-gamers, you, ha you have to also be able to release it on hardware that is, you know, more accessible, uh, which is also a challenge, especially when you are like an artist, because, um, you know, so much of that is about like having like a you know, super optimized, bug-free, you know, like, and, and, you know, and if you are, like, don't have those huge tech resources, then everything you make is pretty expensive, even if it doesn't look like, you know, it's, like, usually it's running, like, has a higher memory cost than, like, something that, uh, you know, that would be commercial. Um, so this is also a challenge, um, but, like, kind of as we kind of were making things, we kind of... Uh, and as we kind of uh, started working with the three of us together, we kind of started like taking like a different approach, which is uh, games as performances. Um, to go to this little gif down here. Yeah, I think like the yeah. last project we did as Triple A, we um, we did like a a live let's play uh, when we launched our last game, and. I think also a big part of why we got attracted to doing performance was after like years of working on games and just releasing things in digital space and having like no like person to person feedback that actually being in a room with people and having them like seeing people experience something you make is really feels really valuable. Um, and the three of us starting to, started to work together as Fantasia Mauer at the beginning of the pandemic. So mm -hmm. I think then once that period of lockdown ended, we also really wanted to do things, I don't know, I guess like in physical spaces with people in front of us. And that is sort of one another reason we got drawn towards performance. Yeah, yeah, like as you say, Fantasia Mauer started during Corona and like uh, it was the start of Corona. And like during this time, live streams were really popular, as we all know. and. Uh, are all probably allergic to at this point is like the live stream thing um, but like the uh, I, I guess like we, we took that online approach into the real world because like the like other other benefits of like doing performance too uh, apart from like what we get out of it is like you know individuals who are isolated and want to kind of like you know take out digital work into like society and not like just live behind a, a screen all the time um, is uh, also the these limitations I was speaking of when you kind of are trying to like exhibit or distribute your your games are kind of not applicable when you perform them because y you only like uh, because the game is played by uh, you as the artist or whoever you basically uh, can use whichever hardware you have and you can also make a game that is not not accessible like you can make something that is like very 
Um, hard like, to play. Yeah, hard to play or obtuse. Or kind you of can like, have controls that are complex that maybe the player wouldn't usually be able to manage or like a player without experience wouldn't manage. You don't have to fix all the bugs because you're playing it live on the stage. Uh, so it's also a way for like us as small-scale developers with not many financial resources to make games and not have to be on on like one to two year game development uh, cycles where we spend like years making games that are perfect. And it gives us also more spontaneity, I think. Mm -hmm. But maybe we should show some like pictures and give some concrete example, because sure. maybe it's a bit abstract. Sure. Yeah. From the portfolio? Yeah. Um, yeah. So these are just some pictures from some events that we've done recently and Maybe we just look at the pictures and then we'll explain what they are after. Do you have anything to say about this one? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh -huh. So some of the pictures are from this event series we've been doing called Fantasia Malware Presents. Um, and when we say like performance, sometimes that me might mean something as simple as like a, a let's play where we like one person just plays through a video game for the audience. Um, but it also can mean something more complicated, like we have also designed games that are intended to be performed for the audience. And so maybe uh, the next thing we could do after this is talk about Sex at Alexanderplatz, which is what we will perform on Saturday night. Um, yeah, but I'll just let you show these pictures first. <laughs> Uh, here's some pictures from Sex at Alexanderplatz. It's a dating game about dating in Berlin. And the three of us perform it live. And basically we take turns playing the, I guess playing the player, who is going on a series of dates trying to meet the love of their life. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so maybe to explain how the game works, um, could you show the, um, the, the casino? Mm -hmm. So to explain how the game works, uh, the, the dating app in the game is uh, a poker machine like at the casino. You can see it in the background here. And this is projected on a big screen in behind us when we perform. And there's like uh, cards and each of the cards has like a, a profile of a person you could go on a date with. And when we pull this giant lever that's on the stage, can you show the other picture? Yeah, when we pull this lever, then the, the casino spins um, and the cards kind of all spin past and then you get matches and you go on different dates. And when we go on the dates, then this is kind of like a visual novel style where one of us will yeah. like read. So yeah, basically we have this this lever that you see here, I mean, I don't know, this big thing. This is a butt plug, by the way. This is a yeah, the, gigantic butt plug. Yeah, the top is a giant butt plug. Um, which is, uh, to tell you the full truth, not actually really connected to the game, but we kind of <laughs> pretend it is, which is one of the things you were both saying of, like, uh, making it simpler for us to, like, just pretend it's, yeah. it's connected, but just, like, fake it somehow. And uh, yeah, when we activate this, basically it activates the machine, and the machine then tells us what we should do. So it's like a which date a, we will go. Yeah. So it's like a feedback loop of like the, the stage elements tell us what we do, and what we do influence the stage, and, and so forth. Yeah, we don't like really try to be like actors. Yeah. <laughs> because we're not good at because that. Because we can't. Because <laughs> we can't. Either. We try to avoid what we can't do, yeah. which is acting. And so we see ourselves more when we're performing as kind of like NPCs inside of our own game or like, uh, I guess, like elements that are being moved around in a system. Yeah. Um, maybe we could show, open the project now because mm -hmm. we couldn't demo the casino. Sure. So this game is made in Unreal. So we'll show you now the what it looks like from inside Unreal Engine. Well, this is the best advertisement for Saturday. <laughs> for, for what? Yeah. Behind the scenes, uh -huh. behind the scenes before you see the work. It's also the worst advertisement for Unreal because it's frozen. <laughs> <laughs> we try again. We try again. <laughs> 
<laughs> Time extension. <laughs> Ninety percent. Ah, yeah. While this is loading, is there anything else we should talk about? Is there a specific reason why we are using Unreal? That's who might, uh, might be of interest to people. Yeah, that, that is a good question. I don't know. Actually. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not using. Is that. there is there a reason we're using Unreal? Is there a reason? I, don't know. I guess we've do, we've done like two games in Unreal and one. Uh, more as a web project, but yeah, I think it, it's well. I think it lends itself to performance because you can have very high graphical quality, so it doesn't matter. Like you can have like a really good machine for doing your performance, but then it doesn't. I guess like if I were to make a game where I want everyone, single person, to be able to download it at home, I might not develop it with Unreal because it creates really like heavy. Uh, heavy graphical things, but for a thing we are performing, it's fine to make something that's very graphically expensive. Yeah. Uh, um. So maybe we can, <laughs> maybe we can demo the yeah. the casino. Okay. These cards, by the way, we also have printed them for real. So that's not advertising, but you can also buy them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's no, they're really cool. They're actually the best one of the coolest thing we have. It's really cool to have. Yeah, yeah we have a card. booster pack of yeah. all of the characters who you can go on a date with. Yeah, and we will also... Saturday. Yes, on Saturday, if you come to the event, you'll get one free card. Yes. <laughs> that is definitely advertising. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, okay, shall we show yeah, it? Yeah, let's demo it, yeah. So, I will pretend to pull the lever. Okay. <laughs> okay, and then we have buttons that we hit. <laughs> okay, and we go to match. <laughs> okay, cool. And shall we like go into the date and then like, I can yeah, also maybe. skip this one and go into the next one? Yeah, let's skip this one. So yeah, now we would be on stage reading the date, basically. Yeah, so yeah. This, sty this part of the game is like a visual novel style where you go through different dates. So, so I'll go through this, finish, and we go back to the casino, and then we could actually do a, a real like mini date. Yeah, sure. Okay. We could do a mini date. Yeah. So, no spoilers. <laughs> Not important storyline. Okay. Okay, all right, okay. so we'll do it again. All right, okay. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's actually my... Okay. Okay, Should we do a fake one instead? Should we give me the real mini day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's do a mini day. Yeah, let's do a mini day. Mini jacks, okay. No. Let's do this one. Okay. Do you want to read it? Sure. Okay. Can you see from here? No. No, let's hop with you. I'm just going to read the date as if I would be in front of the stage now. You meet at Alexanderplatz in front of Primark. The date arrives late and immediately explodes. Boom. Now your new dress is drenched in blood and guts. Whatever you think. You've heard that these things are happening more and more lately. Something to do with light pollution or social media. You don't remember which. On your way home, you feel a bit stuffed and wonder if you might explode too. Explode too. Great, you think. One more anxiety for the list. And that's it. Yeah. Should we do another? What do you think? We can do well, another. We can show a little bit of the video. Oh, you can do another. Do another. Yeah, we'll do another. <laughs> okay. Okay. Eleonora, asexual bottom, a timorous, into board games and list making apps. Shall we read it? Yeah, let's go for it. You meet at Alexander Platz on the stairs of the public toilets. Right away, the day starts to cry. The restroom attendant starts to cry. A random guy selling sausages with a portable cart starts to cry. The day seems sad, so you buy them a brat first. You watch them eat the tear-drenched sausage and you start to feel a bit horny. You go home. <laughs> you go home and masturbate to a video of hot men arguing about Marxism. Then you lie down and cry. Should have gone to breakfast for myself, you think. 
before drifting to sleep. I've never heard that one before. I think we never read it out loud. It's okay. actually pretty funny. Okay. Okay. Alright. And on and on it goes. Yeah, so yeah, so now. Maybe we just show a bit how the state of. Yeah. I don't know, I guess we're gonna do it on Sunday. The side video, I mean, I can mute the video and we just like talk. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, yeah cool. Um, okay. Um. This is a video of us performing it last year at a maze festival in Berlin. Um, we don't want to show too much. Yeah, no, we yeah, don't yeah, want to show too much. No spoilers, no spoilers. Um, yeah, so uh, why, are we, why are we talking about this game? I mean, overall, I think you could show the idea that it's like a way to use the video game as a, almost as a stage, as a theater thing. Like, because at the core, it's like a video game, but the way we use it is, I guess, to build a performance. Which, yeah, but yeah. like not a performance with like a traditional narrative. Yeah. I think like, I think what's been really interesting with each of the performances we do is we try to think of a way that the game is some kind of like system that drives our activity. Yeah. Um, and there might be like a narrative in there that's sometimes kind of like getting disturbed or disrupted, but it's not. I don't think it's like a traditional story. Yeah. Exactly. Although there's like storytelling elements in there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And most of the time, I think it works actually pretty well because I guess for people who are interested in, in who are not who are like interested in video games who don't get to play them, it's a good way of discovering them yeah. or of like, uh, like I mean, and even for people who, are, who play video games, I mean, I guess technically speaking, I play video games, but in real life, I never get to play them because I don't have time. So that's like a good way of. I guess experiencing them in a in another setting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's true. I also think there's like there's a lot of people who are, which I think of the events we do in Berlin, like a lot of people who attend are people who are like curious about like or like interested in video games but don't play games uh, because maybe they uh, weren't. Um, Involved, like they kind of didn't kind of have like social access to like experiencing them when they were younger, so they might then feel like intimidated or like not able to but, like play games. But they, are well, I curious. think there's also like a lot of people who played video games when they were younger, and now have jobs where they have to work at the computer, mm -hmm. and so don't really want to spend that time on the computer, but still have like an affinity for the genre or for the. Also for the form. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so yeah. So there's like there's a lot of people. Yeah. It's like it's a nice way to kind of experience something that is we typically understand in a way that is like a bit more like isolated and and and, and also like uh, we're talking about like how you can also exhibit games. I also don't think this is like a better or like a the superior way. I think it's just like I'm just saying all this is like a it's like another way that you can present interactive stuff. Like I don't like you know I think it's. Yeah, it also depends Every, yeah. what your goal is, I guess. Yeah, like, yeah. I think what's fun for us is also, like, or from what's fun for me, at least, is building systems together, like, the three of us kind of building a system and then being inside the system together. Yeah. Um. <laughs> cool, maybe we can continue on the yeah. map. Okay, where to now? Left, right, up, down? I don't know what's there because I never saw the map, but let's go left. <laughs> left, right. Yeah. Well, it's just yeah, dead end, Gabriel. Yeah, this is the Gabriel. first time that Gabriel has done this talk <laughs> yeah. with us. Yeah. Usually Jer and I do it without Gabriel. Yeah. <laughs> well, if we go up. Like a little baby, I have no idea what's happening. <laughs> That's the life of St. Fiona up here. We, yeah, could, we could visit that. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. The life of St. Fiona. So how sh maybe should we just cold open and just like... Yeah. Read it? Yeah, maybe we'll just show you the work and then talk about it afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Right. And we can read a few. Yeah, okay. Let's read a few.
slug on blade. The signature weapon of Saint Fiona Bianco Zeno. Towards the end of her life, Saint Fiona discovered the slug slime she was farming could be hardened into a bioplastic known as polymanata, once combined with slug, piss, shit, and cum under the light of a half moon. Polymanata would go on to be used for all crystal eye technology due to its incredible durability yet immediate natural degradation once in contact with salt, a quality making it particularly useful in reducing ocean waste. On, upon St. Fiona's death, the Slugon blade was passed down to her successor, November Zena. To this day, it remains a heirloom gifted to the matriarch of the Crystal Eye Network. The trial. This little wax figurine was commissioned by Baldex Stanley, 20, 28th Earl of Gunwell, to use as a bathtub plug. It depicts the Carmine trial when it was decided to grant saint, sainthood to the late Saint Fiona Bianco Xena. Present at her trial were her son, Francis the Ungrateful, the last survivor of her 399 children her biographer Anselm Faber Finch Jr., her guardian angel Puritanius, and her first lover Ego, seen here face palming, a gesture presumably symbolizing the decline of the Western happy times. The figure in the back remains mysterious, but is believed to be an executioner Laron, who fed St. Fiona to a cornucopia of starved hormone slugs. Should I swap with you? Yeah, sure. The Speckled Skin of St. Fiona Biancozina. St. Fiona Biancozina had distinctive and unusual markings on her skin, the origins of which were treated with suspicion by many influential public figures at the time. Debate and controversy considering her skin continues today. The International Orchid Collector Association claims St. Fiona as one of their own. A hero of orchid specimen collection whose rare and beautiful appearance was caused by a brush with a previously unknown species of orchid in the swamps of Louisiana, which causes extreme pigmentation mutations upon skin to plant contact. The Conservationist Society of North American Wetlands condemns St. Fiona as a reckless and pig-headed disruptor whose unfortunate rash was caused by a predictable accident that occurred during one of their insensitive and risky romps through the Louisiana wetlands. Accusations recently published in Saints Now magazine suggest St. Fiona genetically modified her own appearance in order to better promote herself as an orchid influencer. Shall we talk about it now? Yeah, we can talk cool. about it. And, on it. and basically it continues like this. You have like a lot of different items on screen and you can read the, his, the history associated with them. And uh, maybe we should talk about I guess like our idea yeah, of making idea the work. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess what you maybe haven't uh, really, cannot really notice on such a short, short presentation is that basically it's about the saint, Saint Fiona Bianco Zina, but there's like three very different voices and three very different... I think even more. Like even actually, technically yeah. even more, but there's like very different interpretation of her life. So it's not like one singular story, it's very different contradictory uh, like in some cases she will be a terrorist, in some cases she will be, I don't know, a fraud, in some cases she's a, a, martyr, a martyr, or a hero. in some cases she's a patron saint. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, and maybe it's interesting to say how we made the work, which is um, we eat, each wrote like three, I guess, separate stories of her life, um, written in kind of short episodes, and then we swapped them and read each other's, and then we rewrote each of our own stories to try and, I guess, like build these links between our stories. Um, but what we did is we chose link, uh, items from 
the other story, the stories of the others. So say Gabriel wrote a story where she has pink hair because she uses it, or I don't know, for um, medical research. Yeah. Her hair is collected for medical research. Then maybe I would say she's known for her pink hair and that, that it was actually like a weapon or basically we choose elements from each other's stories and, and kind of change the meaning of them in our context. Uh, yeah. And I guess the idea that we were getting at is that people's stories are kind of um, interpreted at the whim of the people telling the story. Yeah, yeah but there is like some um, unknown uh, objective or truth or something that like you can only imagine what it is from all these different interpretations or fragmented uh, narratives of her life um, and uh, and then like so it's, you, it's kind of like you're telling the real like there's this like the real story is like kind of like not actually told and you're just getting these legends of it yeah, yeah. I think it also creates like a creates a texture of a world um, with like hints at stories without like a kind of a to B to C narrative um, so it kind of like hints at a lot of mystery or a lot of uh, backstory that's never fully excavated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and these kinds of like writing, uh, you know, techniques or like uh, is something that we've also been doing a lot of. Like this kind of like a, uh, I guess, um, like what, what would you call it? Like non-linear, like um, world building or something yeah. like this. Uh, like and it, like uh, you know we have it in this and Orchid Collector and Sex with Alex of kind mm. of like it's like you're kind of creating this story by all kind of starting in different places and then uh, and then like kind of um, connecting these narratives because it's the same actually with Sex with Alex there is these like uh, these details as you play through it which are kind of um, uh, you know uh, mentioned somewhere else and then like the, uh, and then, and this is like all these different uh, threads which we are like kind of um, like like a kind of weaving together yeah. in some way I, I think like it's also a way for us to work together and have um, for the, for us to bring our voices together and for each of our voices to be kind of important in the way we're making something but for it not to have to we don't all have to change everything we're doing to suit each other. There's like many voices in the work that also contradict each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like it's not like we make everything by consensus. We can also have like tension in the work where there's competing points of view or competing narratives. And, and I guess it also like um, uh, lends itself quite well to our visual aesthetic too. This kind of like um, having basically this maximalist everything's turned up to like a thousand um volume vibes um yeah yeah shall we go to the next uh yeah, go to station? The next station next station right. so where to now to the right like the whole of europe <laughs> 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 Huh. Oh, looks familiar. Look, look at that. <laughs> well, I think we've already been to Sex at Alex. Yeah, we did this. I think there's like still the um, the event series. Yeah, here it is. What's yeah. This? Speaking Turn of the pill. devil. Nice. Okay. Turn the pill. All right. It's drugs time. All right. Yeah, so I guess the last thing we were going to talk about is this event series we run, um, which we started doing in 2022, and we will continue this year. Um, and basically, uh, the kind of model is for each event, we have one video game performance that is done by either one of us or all three of us together, and then we always invite a guest. Um, someone we kind of know from I guess like our community or, or people that we are that we talk to often whose work we kind of look at a lot and they give us feedback on our work and we give them feedback on theirs um, 
part of the reason we started doing this is it was a way we could get funding to make our work and also to support the work of other people we know. Um, yeah. yeah, it was kind of like no one's going to fund uh, games as art, so we tricked them by organizing cultural events <laughs> where we fund <laughs> yeah. the production of games as art, basically. Yeah. Yeah, and it was also a way where we could organize a context for our work without having to like wait for curators to tell us where our work fits in or um, yeah. kind of pair us with things that they think we belong with. Yeah, because I guess like all like all the people who've performed at these events, which is like yeah, like uh, these other people we are also inviting. It's like we're there's like a part of like a scene of like I that I feel like it's. Uh, like you know, it's like you have maybe like, like kind of the institutional artist or like ca canon, like you know, like the artist, and then that which is kind of like a uh, like a certain type of video game art. And then you mm. have like the kind of the more like video game scene integrated, <laughs> like the indie game weirdos. And then I feel like we're kind of like a kind of like a different one again, like in terms of like yeah. the, in terms of just like a, a scene basically. And like it's also a lot of people who've like who've worked in their career as basically being artist assistants for um, for like more institutional interactive art. So it was also really cool to just like you know make an event where these people can actually just show their work that no one gets to see and and like um, you know just support your buddies, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would say there's quite a bunch of people who make interesting thing in the the niche that we have, which is, I don't know, like experimental game performance stuff, but there's not much places where these people are visible at the moment. Like, there's not much media where these people are talked about. There's not much exhibitions or in big museums or something. So it's still kind of a, a, a thing where you have to find your own, or organize your own, make, make yourself visible yourself, basically, and organize your own events and stuff. Yeah, but and actually, that's actually ended up being really fun. Yeah, uh, I, I think um, that is the cool thing about like, you know, if no, if no one cares about what you do, it's like the cool thing is that you get to entirely define it uh, for yourself or collectively with your with your peers because like, uh, um, yeah, like you know, we did this event series because no one was going to do it for us and like, but. In doing so, we got to present it how we wanted to. And in the past, like you know, it's like if you're trying to like fit into like a different type of, uh, you know, e event or exhibition or whatever. It's like you know, there's often like a lot of meaning or like uh, put or like expectations. And then, it, and it's nice not to just do that and to just like be able to define those things yourself. Yeah. yeah, I guess like the downside of it is it's. A fuckload of work <laughs> to run an event series and it kind of puts us in a position of being both like event producers but also artists at the same time and it's a lot of work but yeah it also has been really fun um yeah and i guess we uh pragmatically we manage that by like uh sometimes uh like with the 2022 series like it was like we would have the artist uh, who's showing the work is kind of taking a step back on the kind of like organization of the event. So, yeah, so, so like, like theoretically, like if you were showing your work at one event, then Gabriel and I would do more of the logistical work for that event. And then we'd take turns next time, maybe it would be me, and then the, you guys would do the more logistical work. Yeah. And, and I mean, and I also think another reason that. You know, I guess also like with the with this event organization and with like also our collaborative writing and stuff and all these things is like I guess another reason it works is because we uh, work very well together, which I think is like only comes with time and like um, and also uh, because we were like in this ten person collective, it's like the three of us kind of naturally I think. Like yeah. even though it was like some kind of like a like three of us I think are very. I collaborate very well together, so I think this is also like another reason that these things actually are the way they are, yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Um, is there like anything else we would like to say? Because if there isn't, we could also see if anyone has any questions or. Yeah. Is there anything else that we wanted to say before we finish, though? Um, I feel like. 
feel like there is, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, I'm sure you can come up with any questions now. Yeah. yeah. Do we very happy? I have a few. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> first of all, thank you so much for our stall. That is us, uh, an applause to the national audience. Saturday, live events, lawn party, Divago is the set. But anyway, but first before I have my questions, which might not be adequate. First, do you have any questions or comments or uh, stuff to ask our dearest guests from the hell that is burned? <laughs> because uh, I've seen the website before and I don't remember how I stumbled upon it. I didn't know that you made the website. So I probably like scanned a QR code or something in Berlin. Did you promote it in, uh, in any way? Wait, which website is this? Uh, the Fiona. Oh, uh, I'm not sure. Well, originally it was a work that was commissioned by um, the National Gallery in London, but it was quite a few years ago, uh, I guess three years ago at least. Did we ever have it in Berlin somewhere? But we never had it in any posters. Maybe it's somehow just... I mean, if you play <laughs> games, it's on itch.io as well, so maybe you just found it online. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Actually, we're super bad at promoting ourselves, so I am surprised anyone's ever heard of us. <laughs> came to you from the skies. <laughs> In the hell of life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, St. Fiona Bianco Zeno is a web based work, so you can play it online. Sex at Alexander Platz you can download from itch.io. It might be a little computationally heavy, so if you have like a not super powerful computer, it might not run super well. Uh, but there's also a video of us performing it in that case. Um, and there is one other game we have called Orchid Collector, which is not downloadable. Um, but there is also a video of us performing that one. Yeah, I, I would say that making the game downloadable is not like the number one priority, but we try to make it if it's possible, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, also, we have a bunch of solo work yeah. that we also we, we publish under us. our name. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, this is a, like Fantasia Malware is like, like maybe it was mentioned briefly at the start, it's a collective and a label. So, it's like we, as the three of us, are making work together, which is the projects we were talking about. But we also publish our solo work as Fantasia Malware. So, like, you know, there, so there is also other solo work which is downloadable. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, like all, all my games are also, for example, downloadable. I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and then also I, I have some like web-based stuff that runs in the browser. Yeah. Um, yeah. So these are, I guess, our presently our five downloadable things. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I should put my one there too. Oh, there's also not <laughs> my food game on it. Okay. okay. Well, there's more. Okay. Um, our archive is a mess. But yeah, in answer, we do try and make some things downloadable. Um, not everything ends up being downloadable, but for sure, quite a bit. Yeah. Okay, before I pass it on to you there, I have a kind of maybe a bit a philosophical question. Is a sex that Alexander applies that is downloadable on HIO a complete work? Or does it only come alive as a performance? Um. I, I think it's different. It's two different things. I would say, right? Yeah, I I would say that for for me, like uh, the the live version, uh, probably has like a is I I think presently probably the best way to experience it. But there are things that I would like to add to the downloadable version. So I kind of even in some ways kind of can also imagine, like a. Them forking at some point in some ways, but but uh, but presently it's the, it, it's like the live version which is playable, mm -hmm. but I, I think it's still fun to experience. I guess also because like uh, um, you know in the live version it's like we're reading and kind of like putting our voices into it, but you know with the um, uh, with the downloadable version it's like you know you can also experience it at your own pace and then it's, so it is, it is quite a different experience too. So. Yeah. yeah, and I think also Sex at Alexander Platz we designed 
first to be performed. And we have had other games where we did it the other way around, um, yeah. where we designed it first to be played online and then as a performance. For example, San Fiona Bianco Zina was first as a game you play at home, and we are now developing a performance for it, which we will do this year. Um, so it's not that there is like a rule of all of our games are one way or the other. It depends a little bit on the individual piece, I think. Mm -hmm. I also felt like you're maybe prototyping some of the games during big events, like the Hall of Mirrors, I think was one, was one of the names, right? Mirror Mall, you mean? Uh, Mirror Mall. Oh, Mirror Mall, sorry. Yeah. Mirror Mall and stuff which I didn't see in your catalog, but yeah. was in the documentation for the events. So. Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I mean, yeah, I feel like uh, as, as our, uh, one of our guests once said, that I always think of as like, it was like the, the, first, perform the first performance is the first <laughs> rehearsal or something. Uh, uh, <laughs> and this talk is the fifth rehearsal. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, I figure out what they said, but like there's something like that. Um, yeah, I don't know, like I feel like, I mean, there's also a part of our games I actually like, is that they're kind of like a malleable, uh, like, like uh, iterative uh, virtual world, and like it's something that I've kind of like started to embrace more these days is kind of, never really thinking of anything as being like over but it's kind of like a process that you might revisit later so it's yeah. like you know with like St. Fiona this is something that we haven't touched for like two years or something three yeah. even yeah. Yeah. yeah and now it's like we're coming back to it and also sex with Alex like I put like, if I, I did this, I guess, before having this, like, mindset change, but, like, it's, the upload is called Sex Alex Early Access, but now I would just consider it, like... A it, version. Yeah, it's, and it's like, a constantly a early access, right? It's, like, you're kind of, you know, changing things all the time, and then, like, yeah. So, yeah. Um. There was a question in the back <laughs> um, good question I mean sometimes there or often there is a way of accommodating both opinions I mean sometimes we do literally just disagree and then two people have one opinion and the other one person has another and that person gets downvoted yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> so, yeah sometimes we relegate yeah, to democracy uh, and then other times I guess it's also, you know, when you collaborate, there's also, like, the, like, pick your own battles, I guess, you know, it's, yeah. like, sometimes you have to, like, you know, let someone do the thing that you disagree with so that when you really want to do something else, you can, like, you know, <laughs> uh, do that. Uh, it uh, also depends, like, there is often ways of, I guess what's cool about the way we work is often there is a way to have two opposing points of view that are both present in the work um, and that's okay. Like it doesn't have to be that, that a piece has like a um, coherent or only one coherent point of view. It can have like multiple opposing points of view. Yeah, yeah I think the way we build our work is often allows often for the conflicting opinions on one thing. So it's not like, for example, that we make a... a detective game where you find out oh the murderer is this person and one of us would be no I want the murderer to be the other person and then we clash in this case we would be like everyone is the murderer because <laughs> you can say whatever you want and it we work together so it's but of yeah. course there is like limitations to There's this limitation. like when we were making Sex at Alexanderplatz we made it quite fast yeah. And right at the end, there was some, yeah, definitely like very like strong debates about like uh, how the structure of the performance should be, the order of things, rewriting things, what um, whether a text should be in first person or third person. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes we did just like two people have one opinion and the other person loses. <laughs> but it doesn't, it's not really a pattern, I would say, of like, I don't think it's usually always two and one the same person losing. I think it kind of switches yeah, a lot. It switches up. Three, I think, is a good is always a good number because if you four or like if it's like it can be like teams of two against two and three, it's like always this. Yeah. Although like actually, when I think about it, I think Gabriel doesn't lose very often. Really? <laughs> <laughs> but maybe you have like less controversial opinions yeah, than maybe, Jiren. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I have no opinions at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> 
<laughs> insults. Only <laughs> for <laughs> insults. Oh, oh yeah. like okay. things that we like. Yeah. Wait, sorry. Maybe we can talk about some of the people that we had in the events in the last yeah, years. Sure. So one of the um, one of the artists who's also showing a game on Saturday is Jeremy Kuya. Um, he is someone that was uh, featured in one of our events. Um, yeah. yeah, this is an older game of his, Escape from Lavender Island. I'm not sure which game is showing tomorrow. It's, it's this one. It's this ah, one. this yeah. one. Okay, cool. So, we recommend Jeremy. <laughs> I think there's a photo of him here too. Yeah, th here. that's Jeremy playing uh, his game. <laughs> um, there's also M. Maybe there's a photo in the same series. Oh, it's in the portfolio. Actually. Yeah. Uh, so... When we did our event series in 2023, we did one event featuring M. Um, and M makes, I guess it's like a game that uh, where they are also performing music at the same time as playing it, and they're controlling the game using gloves that they use during their dance. Um, and they've also made a few really nice like web-based things that you can play at home yourself. Um, they're based in Finland, so we also went to Finland earlier last year now and did an event with them there. Um, who else? I mean, there's many people. It's really oh, also Alpha, too. who makes our posters. Alpha, also Harry. Yeah, um, the person who makes our posters, Alpha, uh, he's a great game designer and also, I guess, illustrator, designer. This is the poster. Mm -hmm. Um, I was meaning to make a, a blog post about all the games I like this year. Maybe I'm going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, also, my uh, famous. Um, I'm joking, it's not famous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wait. Watch your fast. I think I wrote about some games I like. Yeah, this is Jira's blog. Oh yeah, here's some games I like. If you just wanna, <laughs> yeah. This one, this one's quite old. I'd like to do this again. Um, yeah. Oh, this one's great. This one's really good. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, we could go over right now. <laughs> yeah. It's just like a. Uh, like a space that you navigate. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. How do you? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, there's like many cool things. We should have a new project ready for them. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So, any last concluding comment, I guess? Okay, if there isn't, then thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you for being here with us as well. I won't say that. I won't repeat it anymore, I promise. And yeah, thank you so much and good luck with your future works. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for having thank us. You. Yeah, thank you so much for organizing everything. <laughs>